Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, how the heck are you? We are at the end of July 2024. How is your summer going? This episode with Jen is, I think it's a good episode. I don't know what I'd tell you if I thought it was a sucky episode. I don't know. We talk about setting the bar low. I talk a lot about my OCD and some of the things that are coming up and what's been coming up between me and Jen and how we're navigating it. I think those conversations are rich and deep. It takes us a little while to get there. But we also talk about setting the bar really low and some of the ways that maybe rigidity, perfectionism, transitions, doing new things, all or nothing thinking can really make it difficult for us wanting to have things figured out, can often inhibit us from really stepping into our lives. And Jen has an example of where that shows up for her. We talk about just accepting and how difficult it can be to accept what's going on and to lean into it and when we resist some of the things that can be challenging. We talk about attunement, lack of attunement, how we are raised to be kind and polite and that sometimes we need to learn to be a little bit saltier and to be a little bit more authentic and how we often are not really clear when we don't want to do things or can't do things or we want to believe that we can and we don't set limits and then we end up inadvertently disappointing people when it would just be kinder to say, I don't think I can do that. I'd love to, but I don't think I can. And how that can often be kinder to set very clear expectations. And then, like I said, I talk about some pretty specific things. I did end up taking some meds for my OCD and beta blockers to help regulate my nervous system. I wasn't going to some new ways that the OCD is showing up. Yay. Please note sarcasm. It's interesting. I was talking to my husband the other day, bemoaning like, how come at almost age 61, I'm having to deal with this OCD and feeling angry about it. And then I thought, you know, if I had a choice of choosing OCD or not, I'd choose not. But since that doesn't seem to be an option, I really am grateful that my kids are raised. They're out of the house. I work from home. I have a very manageable work schedule. My life is pretty comfortable and I have a lot of control and autonomy over my life. And I think that I'm pretty privileged, even though this stuff is really hard and I have to deal with it, it would be much harder for me if I had young kids, if I was working full time, if I was working full time outside of the house and had way more demands. I'm pretty blessed that when I have a hard day and I cry and things get to me, I'm able to stop doing what I'm doing for the most part and take care of myself or go lie down. I recognize that this may be hard to hear if you're someone who's not at this stage in your life and you're having to deal with really hard things and you don't have that privilege. But it really changed my insight around, I'm pretty blessed in the life that I have, even though this stuff is feels like some of the hardest work I've ever done. And sometimes it feels pretty debilitating. I'm able to show up for my clients and really grateful I'm able to move my body and do the things that I need to do. And it's just bleeping hard. So I think that's all I have. And now on to the show. Hey, Jen. Hey, Patricia. How are you? I'm doing good today, I think. I don't know. I think it's a little bit of a mixed bag. I like kickboxing. I know. (laughs) First time for you. Yes. It was so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. Now I have to see if I can fit it into my life or make room for it or build it in or I'd love to do something a little more active and fun and get me get me out and going. And it felt good though this go round. I wasn't very self conscious. My face gets really, really red mm-hmm. when I work out. So people were all really sweet and yeah, I was excited. Nice. How are you? you? Yay me. (laughs) And thank you for your support. I think I had been kind of hemming and hawing about it for a while. And then when we were talking yesterday, 
<laughs> I don't know what magic words you might have said, but I was like, yeah, I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah. And we had talked about what if you just go, why don't you find out when the class is? And then you went online and you found it and there was one today. And, you know, why don't you go and go for five minutes? And if you go for five minutes, that's all you have to do. Because I think we do this thing of, you know, I go on, I don't like it. And then it's a failure. And for you, my perspective is it was more important for you to get the information and just get your body there to get the information about, do you like this or not? And if you don't, then to leave. But I think we set the bar so high that then we go and we don't like it or we don't stay for the whole class or it's too hard. And then we feel like a failure instead of like, I went and tried and like, this isn't it. And now I'm going to try something different and to let that be okay. Yes. No, you're right. It was, uh, I always, ugh, I have to, I should probably, I don't know, tattoo that on my palm of my hand or something. <laughs> Just like set the bar low. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I ended up having fun and definitely listened to my body and slowed down when I needed to. And I've been, I have been a bit more physically active lately, which has been, you have been good for me, like with hiking and stuff walking I even I got a new bike seat <laughs> mm -hmm. so make my bike a little more comfortable for my old lady bones here but it's been good so yeah that was it was perfect but setting the bar low you're absolutely right like it was an accomplishment to get there and then it just so happened I did like it and I'm looking forward to going back I may even try and go Monday uh today yeah. is Saturday that we're recording so and then I have a vacation in there. So I'm hoping it's funny, the energy of, well, I can't go now because I'm not in the state. <laughs> Might I know how I am, right? It's probably the fact that I can't go is going to make me want to go. So I'm hoping that when I get back, I'll be all like, woo. And then that it'll get in, just get into my routine. Right, right. Well, I think that if you're neurodivergent, if you're ADHD, if you're autistic, if you're ADHD, I think we often have this very rigid thinking, very all or nothing thinking, very perfectionistic thinking. And so we can't figure it out. We can't do it perfectly. We can't do it the way that we think that we're supposed to. Then we don't do anything and we don't take any action. I think the overwhelm, the decision making, new things can be hard. Transitions can be hard. And I think that those are all ways that often prevent us from taking that first step because of all the uncertainty. And so finding, for me, finding ways to really lower the bar to just get my body there. And then like, if I don't like it, then I can leave. And I think I've talked about this before that even with Aquafit, I'm like, I don't have to go for a whole class. I forget that because sometimes I want to paddle the same day that I do Aquafit and sometimes it's too much. Or if I'm just tired, like I don't have to go for the whole class. But I think for those of us that are very concrete in our thinking, we think that, you know, if you go, you go for the whole class. I, I mean, I have this thing that if I were going to be late, I probably wouldn't go to class. Like I can show up late. I can show up when the class is halfway over. So does any of this resonate for you? And if you have this type of thinking, is it serving you and is it working for you? Or are there ways that you can create a little bit more flexibility and options so that your life works for you? Yes, I love that. I did have to apologize for being late. I was about a minute late and I ran in and they're like, I mean, it's funny. Most, I guess it, it all depends on the environment. You know, like I know if I'm going to walk into a class, I do need that kind of flexibility and the people around me to understand that human life on planet earth right now can be hard, complex. It can be difficult, right? So right. that sort of flexibility I think is really helpful. I know it is for me. I mean, I just, I just require it. You know, that would have mm. been one of the things that if it had been sort of a little more and, and some places I'm not, I'm not meaning to throw anything under the bus here. Like I've certainly been in some environments where there is a sort of maybe formality to them. I've done martial arts before, like stuff like that. It's kind of fun getting back to my roots here with the kickboxing, but, and that's okay. It just doesn't work for my life now. And I know that, mm -hmm. You know, and these guys were just like really friendly. And, you know, there was one point where I was kind of, I have a hard time with pacing myself, right? So like I'll mm -hmm. go all like really super hard and get exhausted and then not be able to continue. And they were playing music. And so I was able to like stop, but keep dancing around and just like, they were like, yeah, like it, it was, you know, and that's how I could tell like that's, 
this place that I visited today is but really I, I was getting a lot of indicators that they could be my place. Nice. Yes. Mm. How are you, my dear? Mm. Mm. It's a mix. I went to Aquafit. I vacuumed this morning. I had a cry. I had some feelings. I'm a little on the edgy side, which is feeling a little bit challenging for me. And I think I have this expectation that if I move my body, I won't struggle with my mood. And the reality is I probably am managing much better because I did move my body and like there's just a lot going on. There's so much that I feel like I don't have control over. And we'll we'll talk about this in this episode. So just trying to lean into that and have as much gentleness and compassion, but it's challenging. And I have this awareness and this gratitude that even though this is hard, I'm feeling pretty blessed. I mean, would I choose it? Probably not. But since it's here and I don't have the option to wish it away, banish it away, I really believe like the only way out is through. So I may as well do that. Yes. Beautiful to embrace it, right? To be willing to be in relationship with those aspects that are harder and the uh, that if onlying. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know just to join with you, like I had a cry today in the car. Mm -hmm. I think I was poloing you and it started to happen. Yeah. And it's all okay. I think I know that for me, I was thinking about this the other day, like. When I start when I start to soften to myself, right, and having self compassion, and and sort of being willing to show up to whatever's arising, or another phrase you could think of is like when you unmask and you just kind of show up real for yourself. It does. I know for me, it's been making it a little more intense, and that's okay. Yeah. And I know as we've invited it and discussion about it with each other in our friendship, it's also been okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I met on, so you and I were supposed to record together on Wednesday. It didn't work. I did a solo episode instead. And it, it's funny. I was thinking about this. So I want to share something that I said in the episode. I actually thought about doing this in the intro and outro to avoid having to say anything to you. So I feel like I'm, I'm doing a little bit of a curveball at you. Are, are you okay with that? Yeah, let's do it. So we can always toss um, this one. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't think we need to toss it. But in episode 253, we were set to record, it didn't work. And I said, do we just need to not record? And you said, yeah, I'm not going to record. So I sat down to do a solo episode. And I started out by saying, I'm feeling annoyed. And it was shifting gears for me. You and I, you had asked me if I was upset. Did we do, need to do repair work? I'm like, no, I'm just disappointed. And that felt real to me. And then when I sat down to record, like I was annoyed at having to shift gears. What occurred to me after the fact, that, though, is that, you know, you and I are very good about naming our feelings and knowing that it's the same as saying, I have an itch. I have a scratch. I'm happy. I'm tired feeling angry, feeling annoyed, feeling disappointed. Like those are just all things that we experience and they come and go. And then I thought, what if people think like that I'm really mad at you and that because I didn't say that I wasn't annoyed at the end, maybe people thought that it was a big thing. And if you don't have this emotional intelligence and this, um, and I'm not saying that if you don't, that you're not emotionally intelligent, but if you don't have this language of feelings with somebody that maybe me saying that I was annoyed felt like it was much bigger than it was or it was dangerous or that there was a rift in our relationship. And for me, I can get big mad. You can get big mad. We have feelings. We work through it. So I, I know we didn't talk about talking about this. So I just want to check in anything that I said that <laughs> we need to talk about. No, 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 you're right. One of the things I've been trying to live with or train kind of in myself, because I think we're all a little affect phobic, especially the more negative ones, right? I'm negative mm -hmm. in air quotes because it's really just, you know, like having a sad soundtrack at a sad part in a movie is not negative. It's just, it matches whatever it is yeah. that we're going through. And since I did some training with Gabor Mate and heard like one of the thing, core things that we need that none of us really get 
is knowing that it's safe to feel the full range of human emotions fully. And I've really been meditating on that for a while. And yeah. annoyance, anger, like these things are not like the death knell of a relationship, mm -mm. right? That mm -hmm. there should hopefully be space for it. And if you can name it, a lot of times I think you and I experience, I don't want to speak for you, but I know for me, I'll name it and it's like, oh, <laughs> There it is. And you just sort of listen to it like background music and then it it, it goes its own thing. I even had that experience, oh, today, because when we both got on together before we hit record, you were talking about feeling a little edgy. I think I was talking about feeling a little edgy. Mm -hmm. And then once I named it, as we were at, at one point, I was like, oh, I'm not edgy anymore. Like it just, yeah. you know, I think it, it can kind of pass through us and, and not that it's not going to show back up. I mean, I could be edgy in the next five minutes. Right. <laughs> But that it's really, it's okay and it's safe to name between us. And if you don't feel like it's safe for you to, if I, if I don't feel like it's safe for me to feel the full range of human emotions fully, and then I'm walking around pretty convinced that it's not safe for anybody else to feel the full range of human emotions fully, like you could start to see how we can really get muddied up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had told my husband this morning, I came home from Aqua Fit and got out of the shower. And I just said, I just need to let you know, I'm feeling kind of edgy and I'm sorry. I don't choose this. I wouldn't want this, but it's just where I'm at. And he's like, is there anything you need from me? And I said, no. And he told me how much he appreciated me just naming it. And, you know, it's in the room, whether we're talking about it or not. And I think that when we can have that level of acceptance, it just makes a difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've been doing that with the kids lately. We went out to uh, a museum on the 4th of July and it was hot, 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 hot walking around Center City, Philadelphia when it's 100 degrees out is not a very pleasant experience. And so funny, I sent both kids a picture of a cake that said, I'm sorry for what I said when it was 109 degrees out. <laughs> I was talking to Aster later and she said the sweetest thing. She was like, because I, I just wanted to check in because by the, like we had other, another plan and then the building was closed that we wanted to go up to the top of and see the city. And then we had to like walk back to the car and it, it wasn't even all that far, but it was just so hot. And when I checked back in, like, Hey, you know, are you okay? She talked about how much the heat was, was bothering her. And she thanked me for not becoming upset or reactive just in, in giving her space to sort of have her feelings. And where I'm going with that is like, Yes, you get to be annoyed with me, particularly when I showed up in that moment. We're supposed to record. And, you know, we're both on our on our parallel play paths here of development. And so for me to be like, I really needed that, which I did that yeah, day. Right. I conked right out, which is almost like I'm just not a good napper. I don't know what's going on with me right now. Yeah. yeah. So I can I even be willing to, you know, welcome your annoyance? to understand that it's it and its articulation and communication, it's all part of a healthy friendship. Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't love that. It, I felt, I, you know, I, I struggle with flaking out, mm -hmm. but I think it was important on that day for me not to push. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's allowing for all of it. That's right. Yeah. So I want to, I want to move us forward and don't, a little bit more of what I want to talk about, if that's okay with you. It's your podcast, my dear. Yes, let's do I it. Know. <laughs> I know. That was Wednesday. I finished recording and then I sent you a text going, I hope you got some good rest. Because even though I said I was annoyed, it's not like I was feeling angry or withdrawing. And that that felt significant for me to allow myself to feel annoyed and then, you know, to say, hey, I hope you got some rest. So I met with my coach on Thursday. I went to the psychiatrist a week ago. There was a snafu with getting my prescription. So basically a week later, I got the meds that he had prescribed. One is kind of to calm my nervous system and one is to deal with the OCD. And when I met with my coach on Thursday, the previous week, you and I have just been doing an amazing job communicating and really working on staying ahead of the need. Part of what happens with the OCD, and I think this trauma is it's not conscious, but, you know, testing you. Are you going to reach out? Are you going to respond? And then putting a lot of energy on, like, did you watch my polo? Did you reflect? 
And that just is a setup. And so I really feel like this last week, I've been very, very mindful about looking at, do I have expectations? And if I do, to communicate them to you, or if I'm having needs to communicate them to you, and if I have a time frame that I'm wanting to communicate that to you. And in the morning when I wake up to check in about how am I doing before I look at my phone and am I needing to connect with you? And a couple of times I reached out, I I FaceTimed you and, you know, you were at a restaurant, you were busy, you couldn't talk, but just that connection worked for me. So I felt really good about staying. in the midst of it, right? Yeah, Yeah. you did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I appreciate. Mm -hmm. Which I, I guess if I can just interject a little bit, like, yeah. I'm learning that, right? That I doesn't have to be like this quiet, like perfect thing where I pick up, that I can pick up and be like, hey, this is like a little window. I love FaceTime. I love FaceTime so much. And it's like, Mm -hmm. here's a little window into my world. And often we don't stay on that Mm -hmm. long because it's just not, I don't know. You know, those calls were very brief. One is I'm at a restaurant. I can I call you later? I'm like, great, no problem. Yeah. I like that, actually. Yeah. And it's helping me to see that it's not that because I struggle so much with having needs and feeling like my needs are so big and I'm I'm too much to know that a 15 second FaceTime is enough to go like, I'm good. I know you got stuff going on and feeling empowered that I reached out because that's what I was wanting without texting first to make sure that you're OK, not checking your location like these are my OCD things to just trust that I'm going to call you and we'll figure the rest out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I met with my coach on Thursday and said, like, I think I'm good about the meds. I may start one of the beta blockers just to see because my nervous system felt very jacked up. But the other one, I was not going to start. And I talked to her about, I feel like I'm very good about recognizing when the OCD is active and when it's not. It felt like the preoccupation had totally gone, I was able to manage it. And I said, if you happen to see that the OCD is active and I'm missing it, you have my permission, please bring it to my attention. And we agreed that that would be fine. And I was not going to start the OCD meds. However, the next day, I, I think this happened two days in a row. I'll tell you, for me, the OCD is so pernicious. And in The last episode I talked about my fear of, so this is a trigger warning for death. It's just a mention of my fear. You know, I worry every morning that my husband was dead. If he doesn't come into my room by a certain time, I worry my mom is dead. When the kids leave to drive home, I'm sure they're going to get into a car accident. That's OCD. Yay. It just shows up differently. And I was measuring the OCD by how much I was preoccupied with thoughts of you or what you're doing or what time it is there, if we're talking or what you're doing. And like, I've gotten relief from that, but I wish I knew that the name of the character in the movie Monsters Inc. I think he was orange and he was a bad character and like he could shape shift and he could slither under doors. Do you know what his name is? I know what you're talking about, but no, I can't remember for the life of his name. Do you want me to look it up? <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> But it feels like that's what the OCD is. Like sometimes I can tell what the OCD lie is, but then it just changes or I get dysregulation in my body or I start latching onto these stories. It just feels like it's playing whack-a-mole. And you were talking about possibly going away this next week and then being gone the following week. I thought I was managing well. And two days in a row, this happened where I get physically dysregulated I felt very disconnected from you. Everything just felt meh, that I went from this expansive space to not feeling very expansive, and I didn't have a crochet project, and I don't know, just everything felt kind of meh. But two days in a row, I started to cry, and I said to you the second day, like, I don't know if this is like a way that I'm trying to hook you in. It doesn't feel like it's conscious, and I know that when I'm by myself and I get dysregulated, I cry, and that helps to regulate me. So... Like whether it's conscious, unconscious, it has an intention is not, it's not super important. But what had happened the next day is I reached out to you in the morning via text saying, I'm still feeling kind of tender. I'd like to connect with you. And I went ahead and did what I needed to do. And there was about an hour before I heard back from you. And I thought I was fine. I thought I was managing. But then as soon as you reached out to me, the tears came up again. And we talked about this, but when we got off the phone, I thought, 
the dysregulation is changing and I'm not managing very well. And I think at that point I decided I need to start taking the OCD meds in addition to the beta blocker because even though it was something was shifting, I just felt like I, I just couldn't regulate anymore. I do feel like I did a better job staying connected to you, knowing that you cared. Had it been more than an hour, I don't know how long I would have been able to manage. Like, I just don't know. But I have to say it's really challenging when I feel like I'm doing all the things and I'm, you know, trying to take care of myself and I'm doing the things with my thinking and doing the inner work. And I recognize when I'm feeling something with you to tie that back to where my history is, if I need to cry to make sure that, you know, I'm clear that like this is not about anything that you're doing. But to feel so dysregulated is just really challenging. And then this morning we had talked about recording over the weekend since you're going to be gone next week. And I don't think I had a conscious thought about it. If I did, it wasn't conscious enough to say anything. And this morning I woke up and I thought, I think I'm okay not reaching out to you. And then you texted me and I was doing something and then you left a polo for me. And at that point I thought, I wonder if you remembered about recording and you didn't say anything about recording. And then I felt hurt that you didn't remember recording. So it's not like it was a conscious thought, but there was a little bit of me testing when I listened to your polo. And then I got dysregulated and then I got hurt. And then I go through this thing of like, okay, this is my stuff. So I probably should process it on my own. I knew you were getting ready for kickboxing. I didn't want to dump by, you know, being dysregulated and upset and kind of my words are, you know, bringing intense feelings to your morning. But then I thought the perfectionism is about, I have to figure this out on my own before I reach out to you. And it's like, I, I don't, I can be in it. So I sent you a text that just said, you know, Hey, I just want to let you know that I'm feeling dysregulated. I'm going to leave you a polo, but I, Oh, and the other thing that happens is I gaslight myself because you've been doing such a beautiful job reaching out and connecting. I've been taking responsibility. You texted me and then you poloed me and like, here I am upset. Is it ever going to be enough? And then I feel like I don't have a right to be having my feelings, but I also need to separate like both of those things can be true. Absolutely. Yes, you've been making a conscious choice and really reaching out. I've been taking responsibility for myself and my feelings. And it's okay to have feelings about not circling back about recording. And in the text, I said, it looks like recording isn't going to work for this weekend. So let's just take it off the table. And then you said, like, is that what you're dysregulated about? And I said, yes. And so we had a text, a text exchange. And then I had a big cry about it on my own. And then I was able to leave a polo for you. It felt like I was a little bit more regulated. But I think what was challenging about that whole thing for me is that it was very unexpected. It's not like I knew that I was holding on to that or that I was wondering, are you going to remember? Had I been in a place to say like, hey, are we going to record what's going on? I, I believe I would have done that. But there's so much around just managing all of this stuff for me around the OCD and then to feel like it kind of snuck up and bit me is challenging. And then I have judgment about getting upset so easily and having this awareness that like you're showing up so beautifully and, I, and how can I be upset about the thing about recording? Yeah, I hear you. There's so much there. <laughs> like, I'm having like 15 thoughts at once. It's funny. I don't know if this feels true for you. I'm not going through this dynamic that you're going through, but it almost feels like water. Like it's going to find a way to seep through. Yeah. Wh whatever, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, arises. If it's going to come, it's going to come. And like the if only, right? The if only this lines up and that lines up. And <sighs> I have someone in my life who struggles a lot with all sorts of, you know, mental and emotional things. And you know, she'll try to tell me exactly the way she wants me to say something, you know. And so the if only strategies can be really, well, I mean, they just like, I know for me, like they just set me up. Mm -hmm. And that is a really hard crash. I mean, I know in our text exchange, I was like, oh, a, a couple choice words, bleep, bleep, bleep that I can't say that were towards mm -hmm. me. I was like, Oh, like I'm, I'm leaving you a polo as I'm walking my dog and I got a bunch of stuff going on. And 
I forget. I mean, that's just who I am. Mm. Like my friend like texts me like 45 minutes after I'm supposed to be somewhere that I wanted to go. Like I'm, I really mm-hmm. should look at some, probably some medication for myself too, but um, for that. Anyway, one thing that came up while you were talking is as sort of an, I don't know, maybe an alternate strategy instead of the if only is like, it, it just reminds me so, so much of like Marshall Rosenberg's work, the nonviolent communication, which I feel like I mention all the time because feelings and needs like that, they're, they're not in, they're, they just are, they're not in competition. Like one doesn't cancel the other out, you know? And I know when we texted, I was like, as soon as you said it, I was like, ah, oh. <laughs> I didn't mention yeah. it in my bolo. <laughs> And I was like, let's record. Like, I want to. I just I just didn't say it, you know? And that's right. the tricky kind of water is going to find its way. I think, yeah, it's just how we orient to all of these really rough feelings. Which I mean, I have my own version of stuff where mm. I'm preoccupied or things are set up. I'm glad it's not quite so uh, bi-directional right now because it seems like it's easier to handle it one way as opposed to when it's two people. But I think communicating about it when you can, and even that, the caveat, sometimes you can't, sometimes you just have to go into whatever that turn is on the roller coaster, right? That you're riding and here we are, Mm. right? If we're kind and can communicate, we can figure it out. Yeah, I feel like currently we're doing a really beautiful job communicating and working through it. I'd like to believe that I'm really trying to own my stuff and and take responsibility. They're my feelings. You can't fix or change anything about my past and that that's my responsibility. But also if there are things that I'm wanting that I think might be helpful from you in the moment and you're able to provide them, that I can ask for those things. That I can be here with you. Yeah. I can be in it with you. Yeah. And you show up so beautifully for me. Yeah. I hear you keep saying about the if only, and I'm not making that connection. I mean, I guess I have it like, you know, if I move my body, then I'm not going to get dysregulated. And if I communicate, then I'm not going to get dysregulated or things aren't going to hit me. Is that what you're talking about? Or do you have specific examples of? No, it, it, yes, that that's what I'm talking about. See, it, feel, it feels to me like an antithesis to the acceptance. So when we're accepting, we're naming how we're feeling, and then it moves through us and it, it passes really quickly. And it's kind of like when you don't want to feel something and it's like having a spider here, right? It's like if I grab a cup and I put it up, now I'm stuck holding it because <laughs> it's going to escape if I if I let it go, right? So it's um it's just not quite as workable. The if only are the strategies to not feel something that I think we're going to feel like we're just, we just got to feel it. Yeah. 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 It is interesting. I did notice this morning that, and I don't know, I, I think I was telling you this, that a friend of mine started some medication at some point and it takes a while to get into your system. And the first day she took it, she told me she could feel it. And I didn't share this with her, but I didn't believe her, but, but it was a complicated relationship. Anyways, it does feel like the volume was turned down. Even though I got upset, it felt like the volume was turned down and I was not as rattled. I am a little concerned. I just got an Apple Watch and I got a notification this morning that my heart rate dropped below 40 beats per minute last night. And I suspect that's the beta blocker. I let the psychiatrist know, but I have not had um, good luck about responsiveness. So I'm going to reach out to my doctor and see if they have any concerns. I tend to have a low resting heart rate as it is, but it also feels like the beta blocker is just taking the edge off a little bit. Like it's not making it perfect, but it's just what it is, you know? That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you're getting some relief. I'm glad that we're able to talk about it and work through it. Yeah. Yeah. You and I were talking about another situation and I, I think this is very common that something happened with a friend a while ago and I've been managing it. I said something, the friend had what feels like a disproportionate reaction. I think it activated some of their 
history and their trauma, but without recognizing it and being able to say, this is what it brought up for me. They're kind of making the comments about me and how I made them uncomfortable and they don't know what to say or do, which like, if you want information, just ask me for clarification. Let's, let's have a conversation. And I feel like I've been managing and maintaining in anger, hurt, frustration. I don't know. They said some things about me that I found to be mean and unkind and unhelpful and judgmental. And I just have not really put a lot of stock into that because I'm just going to assume that if it's something they need to talk to me about, they're going to talk to me about. But this has been going on for a while and I, I kind of keep trying to connect and it's just not working. And what you and I were talking about is like, I'm fine with it until I'm not fine. And now it's starting to get to me. And now I feel like I had patience and grace and now I'm just like, "Mm." so I'm going to need to show up and I think communicate what's going on for me. And you and I were also talking about, I think when we're well socialized women, we think being polite and kind and respectful and not getting salty and not saying, Hey, I, I made a really simple comment. And if it, upset you, you could have asked me for clarification and we could have solved this thing a long time ago, but instead it feels like this activated something for you. And and I get, I've pulled back from relationships and I have to process and I get very dysregulated. So I'm, I'm not saying that there's a perfect way that somebody should do this, but I don't talk about what somebody else's processes or, or how it's impacted me. And I, I really feel like I want to start doing that a little bit more, a little bit more saltiness, a little bit more pushback, a little bit more authenticity. And if the relationship can't tolerate it, it can't tolerate it. But I feel like I do this thing where I give somebody room and grace and I manage my own stuff on my own. And it's not really working so much for me right now. No, absolutely. And so, I mean, I know I'm learning a lot about this because you've asked me to be salty. (laughs) Right. And to really come out with it. You know, you and another really significant person in my life have both, like, own practically simultaneously been like, you come on, Jen, bring it. Right. And that is, I mean, I guess that permission giving for me has been super helpful. And also this, again, this, like this groundedness, like it's okay to experience the full range of human emotions fully. And if you really want to know someone and if it's safe, if you feel like it's safe for you to feel them and it's safe for them to feel them, it can really be okay. Yeah. And sometimes I know my style of doing this lately and I'm not sharing quite enough of it, but like I'll close my eyes, I'll breathe, I'll kind of feel myself like wrestle with the stuff that's my stuff that's not really the person's stuff. And that took Mm -hmm. me a while to learn like what was kind of (sighs) commiserate with what's going on in the present Plus the emotional fuel that's based in history and narrative and what we call attachment wounds or what portion of that is something that I can share with my person so that they can know me and understand me better. And we've got to, in order to do any of this, we have to throw some perfectionism like right out the window, right? Right. And we have to be patient. Often these conversations have to be one in a series. Mm-hmm. And I like to let 24 hours go between and be like, you know, what was that like for you? And that kind of spaciousness and patience and trust in the process is really helpful, mm-hmm. right? Like uh, if I can use you as an example, just from this morning, yeah, you were having too many feelings to just be like, hey, Jen. What about recording? <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> I hadn't had coffee. Yeah. <laughs> See all my excuses, but it's just letting you know. I spaced out and I need, it, again, it's an act of service, right? To the relationship, to the friendship. To be like, hey. <laughs> but you couldn't in that moment. Yeah. And that's okay too. Because yeah. we, you're processing all of whatever that is. I really do believe in that saying, like, you've got to feel it to heal it. And the more, yeah, right. And like, it's not even about having the dissertation about what it is in our history and all this stuff and all the nerdy stuff that I love to like hang on. It's, it's, it's really the 
tone or the texture that you hold yourself, your experience of being human with, right? That's that like inner kindness, self-compassion. This just is what it is in the moment. It's the antithesis of perfectionism, right? Where it's like, I just couldn't. And then between two people, dynamically, if there's patience and space and everyone knows they're going to get heard, um, but often if someone's in the throes of something, like it isn't time to throw in my throws of something <laughs> on top of that. Right. We've got two different sets of tomato jars getting smashed, right? I'll do pesto this time so we can tell them apart. <laughs> the green ones are mine. But you know that, that we can, everything can definitely be handled with enough space and patience and compassion because it is in 